All right. Good morning. It is the top of the hour. And as you hopefully noticed by the introductory slide that popped up, you are in the correct spot. So welcome to the Arthropod Genomics X uh, Virtual Symposium 2023, our kickoff session, session number one, genomics for insects as food and feed. All right, so just to let you know, this is a joint effort between uh, USD ARS and the I-5K. Um, the I-5K being a, or the USDA being a, the U Department of Agriculture the, uh, within the United States Agricultural Research Service. And the I-5K being a, an initiative, uh, an international initiative to sequence 5,000 arthropod genomes. So in session one, as you know, we're here to learn about insects as food and feed, but we have two upcoming sessions one on April 11th, Insect Genome Biology and Evolution, and the last and final session three, Genome 100 and the Comparative Bee Genomics that'll be occurring on uh, May 9th. So we have the QR code up top. So if you have your phone handy, you can scan that. You can find all the information on the website, same spot you found all the information for this session. And this is all made possible um, through, well, not just me and the people presenting and the uh, uh, organizers today, uh, but through Kevin Hackett, I want to give him a great bit of thanks. He offers a lot of program support and the resources. Um, as everybody knows, administrative support is key for about everything. Uh, special thanks to Glenn Haynes. He is working in the background to uh, operate the Zoom and put up all the registration information for us. Anna Childers uh, who handles the website and does a lot of the Twitter feeds, all the handles you've been seeing. Rob Waterhouse, who handles Slack. Um, channel administration. We'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide, some of the resources that are available to you to continue the discussion. And Pia Olson typically be handling our uh, video recordings and playback. So additional resources that are out there, again, we have a website up and you have received that link by several sources. Um, there's the registration page for the uh, upcoming sessions in case you have not done so. Um, all these videos that you're going to be, or the recordings, will be posted on a YouTube channel. Uh, the link is here. And I'll be dropping all this into the chat later on, to, just to let you know, so you don't have to quickly write things down. Um, in the Slack channel um, location, as well to let you know, uh, first-time users for the Slack channel are required to be registered. Um, so there is a link here to register. And again, this is going to go into the chat for everybody, so you don't have to try to copy this down by hand. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Dunfield, and she's going to start the introductions of our speakers today. Thank you. All right, thanks, Brad. Um, hello and welcome everyone. We are so glad that you joined us. Um, I'm excited to have the honor of kicking off the first session of AGSX 2023. My name is Kristen Duffield and I am a research entomologist postdoc in Peoria, Illinois, working with the uh, ARS. And thanks to Dr. Brenda Opert, this session will now be the third year of three years that AGSX has hosted a session devoted to the genomics of insects as food and feed ingredients. And I'm very excited to have been brought on uh, this year as co-moderator. So as the edible in insect industry continues to grow and advance in these past few years, we are excited today to welcome three industry experts uh, from across the glo globe to tell us a bit about their work to improve the use of insects as food and feed products using genomic tools and techniques. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Eli Salem. Uh, he joined the insect world a year ago after working for 21 years with ruminants, where he specialized in male reproduction and sperm epigenetics. He now leads the genetics team on insects biotech innovations department, where he develops tools to tackle genetic and genomic issues with the application of uh, the mealworm Tenebro molitor. And today he will be telling us about his work on the INFOB project. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to um, Ellie or Brenda, who will be playing his recording. Thanks. Okay, may I quickly uh, have a reminder that people that there is a Q&A box at the bottom. So if you have a question to address to the speaker, please place it in there and not within the chat. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, Stefan. My name is Eli Selem, and I'm working at Insects since almost one year. And it's a real pleasure for us to present a part of our work today. 
I would like to warmly thank Brenda and Christine for this invitation. Today, I will present you the program called INFABRE, aiming to develop a genetic or a genomic selection scheme for Tenebrio Monitor. And more precisely, we will see the design of our population of reference and the first results obtained during this first year of the program. I will start with a short introduction about the insect context, and we will see uh, the main infarb objective and organization. We will continue through the first year result by focusing, first of all, of the construction and the first result of the population of reference, and then the genetic and genomic information that we have obtained during this first year. And we will finish by a very short sum up and the close next step of this program. So, first of all, uh, the insect context and why it's important to apply to them a genetic or a genomic selection scheme. So, the classical livestock deliver high quality product, but with high environmental cost. Indeed, agriculture's and breeding system heavily impact the planet balance by producing greenhouse gas, contributing to a loss of biodiversity, disturbing natural habitats, increasing deforestation, degrading the soil, and so on. And moreover, the global population is growing, increasing in parallel the resource needs and, re and uh, requirements, leading to increase the impact of the human activity, and particularly in agriculture and breeding system. One of the solutions to limit this negative impact could be the insect breeding for feed and food. Now, the numbers of uh, the numbers differ according to the different uh, source to compare insect and classical livestock, but they are all sharing the fact that to produce the same amount of insect protein than from other classical livestock, you will need less resources feed and water, and you will need also less land to produce this amount of protein, and you will emit less greenhouse gas. And according to the insect species, the protein content in dry white is ranking between 35 to almost 60%. Insects are also a source, an interesting source of minerals, vitamins, lipids, and their fast constitute a natural efficient plant fertilizer. But to be a credible alternative, insect breeding have to get out the R&D labs and must shift towards um, a large industrial uh, scale level. And the principal goal of that is very simple, but very important, to produce enough protein to reach the increasing population demand. But these industrial phases already started at insect involve a huge amount of individuals. Indeed, if we consider that we produce insects, of course, uh, insect protein, of course, from insects, but weighting almost 150 milligrams, and this number is for Tenebrio Molitor, to produce one kilotons of proteins, how many insects you will need? Several billions. So, any insect breeding farm will concentrate a very important number of individuals. That's why we need to pay attention on at least two different types of parameters, the biodiversity of our insect population and the performance of the current lines. And that's why the program called INFAB was designed and led by insects. So, INFAB is an applied R&D program uh, granted by BPI France. It's a French institute investing in innovations. This project is also supported by several other national labels as, as Vitagora or the French National Industrial Council. It's a six year project it started in October uh, 2021. And of course the project uh, focused on Tenebrio Monitor.
PAM is leading by insects. As I said before, about three other partners are strongly involved in the project. Aprex Solutions, it's a startup specialized in the development of digital tool mixing um, video and image and artificial uh, intelligence. Thermo Fisher, a well-known company specialized in high throughput sequencing and genotyping. And the CEA, so the Commissariat à l'énergie atomique in French, specialized in genomics and bioinformatic analysis. And several subcontractors are also involved in this project as INRAE or the CISAF. To ensure the development of the best insect lines through each generation and aiming to guarantee a strategic competitivity for insects, the genetic or genomic selection represents an interesting approach. But the development of this kind of selection for the Tenebrio monitor will require disruptive innovations both at R&D level and industrial level. And this is the goal of Infra Project to develop Tenebrio Molitor's phenotyping and genotyping tool, mixing automated phenotyping solution adapted to R&D and industrial process. PAM is composed by uh, three different work packages. The first one, called Genome and Model, is dealing with the development of genotyping tool through different milestones as DNA extraction protocol design and adapted to our insect. The full sequencing of several tenebrio to assess the genomic variability for our population. The design of high density and low density genotyping array uh, or all the genomic analysis. The second one called phenotype and process is handling the production and the phenotyping of the population of reference and all the development of R&D or industrial automated phenotyping solutions. And finally, the last one, called selection and diffusion, aim to merge all these deliverables from the two first work packages to propose a breeding program based on genetic or genomic evaluation. Another very important point uh, or steps uh, is the conceptual is the definition and the construction of our multiplier form between the art of the selection scheme and the final form. This unit will multiply a lot the enhanced lines to feed the farm with enough insect content. Okay, so now we will move to the most interesting part, the results by uh, focusing first on the population of reference. So first of all, you have listed here the main characteristic of our population of reference, called PRE. Uh, larger enough to obtain precise and reliable data with a low standard zero. The target number was set at around 4,000 tenebrio for this population. We consulted this population with unselected individuals as much as possible, and as much as possible, sorry, diversified in order to have a good representativity of all our traits and all the variability of these traits. These individuals were related, so this population is under pedigree, and of course, it's important for the genetic approach. And we decided also to phenotype all the insect developmental stage aiming to address potential future issues. And of course, all of them will be genotyped. Uh, and it's important to uh, address the genomic approach. Used on four different traits of interest, the reproduction, growth and development, feed efficiency, and disease resistance. To acquire all this phenotype, we have developed specific rearing conditions. Now, the first step is, of course, the edit pairing by selecting male and female as distantly related as possible. The laying eggs were collected and counted five times during all the laying period of around 11 weeks, aiming to phenotype the early and the lately fertility. 
And at the end of this period, the adult was preserved for DNA extraction prior sequencing or genotyping. The third X collection presents two different specificities. The first one, uh, it is from this collection that the full seed larvae population were created. And to avoid too much uh, physio physiological age variation, uh, the laying period was reduced to three days and not seven for the other X collection. To address food efficiency and growth phenotype, we monitored at different days of growing the larvae, the feed leftover, and the fresh biomass. And by this way, we are able to calculate uh, all the phenotypes linked to the feed efficiency, like FCR. And since the 60, 63 days post larvae cup formation, a daily control of nymph were done aiming to calculate the, um, the time between the eggs to nymph and all of them are isolated, weighted and sexed. We have generated five complete generations. The sixth is currently ongoing. And as you can see here, from around uh, 700 couples, we can produce and phenotype around 8,000 nymphs used, of course, as adult pool for the creation of the next generation. An important point here is that uh, the reproduction, growth, and feed efficiency are familial phenotype. While all phenotypes linked to the developmental time characterizing the nymph are at individual level. But whatever the kind of phenotype, all of them characterize, in fact, the parents, okay, the couples. So what about variability of our uh, population of reference? So here, two kind of graphical. Uh, we have observed an important phenotypic variability among couples, as, exempl as exemplified here on your left by the total eggs laying count, where the performance is ranking from almost O to around 600 collected eggs. And it's also interesting to observe a very low laying eggs for several couples, illustrating also for this species, probably or maybe some fertility problems. Another example on your uh, right uh, concerning the biomass average daily gain uh, between the day uh, 35 to 70. Underline uh, also this phenotypic variability. Here, the phenotype is ranking from less than one, mi one milligrams to more than six milligrams per day. This normal distribution among couples is not always observed for all our phenotype. As you can see here with all this graphic, uh, the variability uh, is much less important, for example, concerning the food efficiency parameters. Uh, as you can see here for the parameters called DIC, it's uh, the parameter um, related to di digestibility at different days, uh, or the FCR also. Uh, we have also parameters reported in percentage as the egg um, and the etching rate, uh, presenting a normal uh, distribution, but not a Gaussian distribution. But it's expected. So we, we need to take into account also this kind of distribution in our mathematical model. Uh, another interesting point. Uh, it concerns the comparison of the different generations. So here it's the three last generation um, compared in different for different parameters, and specifically here for the biomass for the larvae biomass at uh, six, six, 63 days uh, of growing. And as you can see, the global distribution and the average biomass increase according to the generation. It's strange because uh, we didn't uh, realize any selection during the formation of this population of reference, but we observed a higher biomass 
in general in our population according to the to the generation and to be honest we don't know why uh, it could be a better adaptation of our technician to the tenebrio biology inducing less uh, stress so less impact or the opposite situation a better adaptation of our tenebrio uh, among the generation through our experimental condition we don't know so when, once again uh, we need to take into account the this kind of generation factor in our genetic or genomic approach to, to take into account this kind of uh, shift according to the generation. Okay, so now what about our first steps and results concerning the genetic and genomic task? So as a preliminary step, it was not included inside the INFAP project. But the Tenebrio Molitor genome of reference was updated uh, one year ago. Uh, I put some here some metrics, but if you want to obtain complete information about this assembly and this new assembly, uh, please uh, you can uh, you can read the the associated publication. So here are just few metrics here, but once again, take a, go take a look on the on the on the paper. So, uh, all the DNA extraction were made with a Zimo research kit dedicated for insects. Uh, our colleagues from the CEA used the half of the insect to do the DNA extraction, uh, just in case if we need to, to redo this uh, extraction. And they uh, extracted between 4 to 11 micrograms of DNA. So, enough to do all we want to do. A subset of our population, so around 100, around a subset of 134 individuals chosen uh, to represent all the phenotypical diversity was fully sequenced with a, a, a deep sequencing target at 10x. And this sequencing allowed us to identify, in fact, our SNP's, uh, SNP playground. And indeed, around 10 millions of SNPs were available after the bioinformatic analysis, allowing Thermo Fisher team to propose several designs for the high density genotyping array. And after several discussions, uh, one of these proposals have been, have, has been accepted and proposed almost. Uh, a little bit less than 700,000 SNPs covering the first uh, 49 most important scaffold of the updated Tenebrio Monitor genome assembly. And this uh, 49 uh, scaffold represents more than 90% of all the genome assembly, and they contain almost 99% uh, of all the genic regions included. The, the X chromosome, for sure, and we hope so, the Y. This uh, graphic here, uh, this nice graphic, I like just the position and the coverage, in fact, of the scaffold by the, S, by the selected SNPs. So the construction of the Axiom Identity Array started two weeks ago, and uh, we scheduled the first genotype uh, at the end of March. Okay, so by waiting all the genotyping results and the GABVs, uh, we can appreciate the first genetic parameters on our population of preference, and we based we based sorry these results on the on the three last uh, complete generation. And for several of our studied parameters, a part of the phenotypic variability can be linked to additive genetics. And concerning the reproduction trait, heritability value were ranged from 0.2 to 0.4. And whatever, the, if we consider the early or the lately fertility, the heritability level is quite the same, as you can see here in this table. But the etching rate highlights a better heritability value with 0.44. 
While several positive genetic correlations have been highlighted among the different uh, daily egg laying rates, only one negative correlation has been identified between the total egg laying count and the hatching rate. Also, that um, no relationship was really emerged from the phenotypic observation between these two parameters, as you can see here in this graphic. This weak negative correlation underlines a very important point, a kind of genetic trade-off between the both of parameters. So if we decide to select uh, the number of laying eggs, for example, we will also decrease the etching rate. So it's important to, take it, to consider this point when we will define our breeding objective. The irritability linked to the additive genetic for growth and food efficiency are ranged between almost 0 to 0 0.6. But contrary of the egg laying phenotype where the irritabilities were nearly the same, whatever the considered days of assessments, here the irritability change according to the assessment day of the larvae biomass. Indeed, it seems increased with the larvae age. And the low irritabilities of uh, day 21, in comparison with the other day of assessment, can be probably explained by um, a potential lower accuracy of our assessments due to a very low biomass of the larvae at this age. And it's also interesting to know that in our conditions or in our, uh, for our species, the FCR, so a parameter related to feed efficiency, uh, was not so irritable. Focusing now on the development phenotype, the irritabilities uh, are varying from once again almost zero to 0 0.5. The nymph and the adult weights offer the higher irritabilities and the development time from nymph to adult, the lower. The irritability level between uh, the two developmental time, so the first one between eggs to nymph and the second one nymph to adult, was expected. As the phenotypical variability was quite absent or near to zero uh, among, among couples for the second one. And indeed, whatever the couples and the generation, uh, it takes it takes around seven days, always seven days, uh, from nymph to adult. Once again, several positive genetic correlation was observed among parameters, as for example for the both adult and nymph weights. The phenotypic correlation confirmed clearly these trends, as you can see here uh, in this graphic. Another example of positive genetic correlation between developmental time from X to nymph and nymph weight uh, have been found. Here we face to a potential trade-off once again. Indeed, if we want to increase the nymph biomass, and in same time, if you want to accelerate the insect development, the solution will not be easy to find uh, for the definition of our burning objective. So we will have to make a choice between these two parameters, or we will apply different ponderation uh, in the, um, for these parameters in the burning objective, uh, or we can also conduct two different specific lines specialized uh, in biomass or developmental time. So, in two weeks, approx, we will be able to launch our new generation. And for the first time, uh, this one will be selected for different traits. And the, the choice of parents will be based on EBVs, weighting the GEBVs in maybe one or one year and a half. And uh, today we are still in discussion to decide about the, the selection pressure, but we were agreeing on the fact we are agree on the fact that 
the first genetic lines that we want to develop uh, will be spe will be specialized the first one on reproduction and the second one on the mix growth and development uh, we will continue to generate an unselected line to keep our initial diversity until that we are able to uh, cryopreserve our eggs. So, to conclude this talk, the first project here corresponds, in fact, to our basement of the genomic and genetic selection. We have obtained very important milestones to ensure the global objective, the full sequencing for a SNP selection, the design of identity genotyping array, the production and the phenotyping of the population of reference, the first genetic report with usable heritability to develop genetic selection, so based on EBVs. And the close uh, next steps, uh, current uh, address now, uh, is the genotyping of uh, the population of reference, the, the first selected generation, so the creation of the first uh, selected lines, the genomic and all the genomic analysis from the genotyping uh, data, and uh, at the end of this uh, second year, the first genomic report. I would like uh, to warmly thanks all my colleagues from INSECT, CEA, APREC Solution, Thermo Fisher, and the CISAF, making this project real and very, very exciting. Thank you a lot. And uh, now, if you have any question, do not hesitate. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for kicking us off, uh, Ellie. Um, I had a quick question while Brenda starts moderating or looking through the, the Q&A, um, if that's all right. Um, I'm curious about if, if your company is interested in looking at potential genotype by diet interaction so that maybe these trade-offs aren't always the same under, under different diet regimes, if, it, if there was plans for that. I'm not sure to have fully uh, un un uh, understood your question, but you are talking about the, the, the trade-off that we have observed, that's right? Okay. So uh, to be honest, uh, we are still in discussion about how we will handle with this kind of trade-off. Um, it's it, it will not so easy to find uh, the, the right uh, way to, uh, to go through this kind of, uh, of result, but uh, uh, today, I think we will um, start with different specific lines, one specialized uh, in the reproduction way, and the other one uh, on the growth and the food efficiency. And if we focus a little bit more on the reproduction line, we observe the trade-off between the, the quantity of eggs that we have obtained and the hatching rate. Uh, so it's always the same question between the quality and the quantity. Uh, so we will uh, ponderate differently these two kind of phenotype, but I think we will uh, put more pressure on the etching rate than the total eggs obtained. Okay, Kristen, I think that uh, Kevin Hackett uh, has a question. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, it was quite amazing results from uh, selection. I was wondering if uh, thinking of uh, noblest uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, uh, whether you can consider gene editing uh, to increase the insect production or is it being considered to study gene function? Uh, thank you for your question, Kevin. Uh, first of all, concerning the genome editing, uh, we are also discussing, uh, discussing uh, sorry, about ethics. Uh, in our way of work and uh, in our uh, selection model and so on. Um, I don't know if we will go uh, through this kind of techniques, maybe in terms of research for explore uh, different scientific issues, 
we can play with this kind of uh, technique, but for sure we will not develop insects with a uh, develop edited insect that we will produce uh, for uh, our product uh, for our feed and food. But uh, and the second part of your question, yes, uh, we we would like to uh, to work around the gene function and to uh, un uh, and to understand also why. Uh, different phenotype can be observed according uh, to uh, different environmental conditions. So, but um, if we want, if we are fully open to new collaboration uh, to go further in, uh, in this area. So uh, if, if you want to work with us on these points, it could be with pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and we have a question from Winnie Okayo. I hope I said that correctly. She asked uh, if you could please talk about the geographical source of your original millworm population. And I have a question to, to add on to that. You said that you're maintaining that population for diversity, but do you periodically add uh, other insects into that to because when you rear them in confines, they will eventually become more inbred. Um, so do you add to that population periodically? You're right. So I will start uh, with your question, Manda. Uh, no, uh, our our population is uh, almost closed and we will not add almost uh, until today new genetics or new or different source of insect in our population. Uh, it could be interesting to do that, of course. Uh, but today we we play with our initial uh, playground of diversity and population. And concerning the origin of our millworm population, uh, I was not there when uh, when you when our uh, my team chose the and the source of our population. But um, I know that uh, according to the different population that we can find in Europe, for example, a lot of different lines come from the same place uh, and um, uh, in the uh, in the uh, publication uh, cited a few slides ago <laughs> or a few minutes ago concerning the new assembly uh, new uh, genome assembly of the Neuro monitor uh, the same team published a, uh, an article uh, with this kind of uh, comparison between different source and different origin of uh, the monitor and they saw that uh, a lot of different sources are not so different, in fact, uh, and some of them are very di different from the main population. But um, we lose, I think, a lot, a lot of diversity uh, many years ago, and uh, today we're just playing with uh, what we have, and uh, it could be a problem in a few years, maybe. That's why we need to pay attention on, the, on our biodiversity and to keep uh, it as much as possible uh, important level. Okay, thanks. And Kristen, we have another question and I think I'll let you go ahead and take over and I'm gonna try to get back to the slides and I'm gonna try not to screw it up this time. My <laughs> apologies before. I know you're doing great. <laughs> so no worries. Um, we have a our last question is from Faith. Um, how do you quantify the eggs and are they too minute? Are they too small? So how are you counting eggs? I yeah, it's, uh, it's a manual counting today. So it's take a long time to do that uh, and needs uh, very uh, interesting skills and important skills uh, for our technicians. So it, that, that's why we want to develop an uh, automated uh, solution to count the eggs. But today, yes, we, we had to separate the eggs from the substrate uh, and to count it manually. So it's a very important part of our technical work. I, uh, I've, I've had to do my fair share of cricket egg counting and they're much larger than mealworms, so I can imagine. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. If any other questions come up, please uh, feel free to post those in the chat. I think they have a team at Insect that, that can handle um, addressing those yeah. as they come. So thank you again, uh, Ellie, for speaking with us. And I am going to switch now to our next speaker. 
Um, Dr. Maria Martine Castanero received her bachelor's degree in veterinary medicine uh, in Spain, uh, where she is from, uh, at, where she received her master's specializing in quantitative genetics and pig production from the University of Copenhagen and her PhD in quantitative genetics and fertility and dairy cattle from the U University of Padova. Um, she's also worked in genomics and beef cattle at the University of Zaragoza until she up, I'm going to say upgraded to insects two years ago when she joined Vita Bugs. Um, Vita Bugs is an insect genetics company in Scotland where Maria works as the genetics manager. Her responsibilities include managing the team at a nucleus level and leading the breeding program as well as data management. Um, she also takes part in developing strategy for R&D and production. So I am going to now pass it over to um, Brenda uh, and Maria uh, to, to show her uh, talk. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Martinez Castillero, and I'm a genetics manager in Betabox. I'm going to be talking about genetics, and the title of my talk is <clears throat> Implementation of Genetics, Technology and Strategies for Black Sound of Flight Production. I'm going to start with the outline of the presentation. I will start with an introduction about why would it be a good solution to use insects and about the insect farming sector. I will then talk more in detail about the life cycle and the environment conditions of black soldafly and move on to the section of genetics. Then I will introduce challenges we face and some strategies to combat those challenges and I will end with a summary of the futures crop in insect breeding and genetics. We are facing issues with food production. There's an increasing population, so the question here is, are we going to have enough food to feed everyone? <clears throat> We've got issues with environmental impact and sustainability, as well as overfishing and deforestation, and the fact that we're wasting one third of what we produce before it reaches the consumer. One novel solution to face these challenges would be the use of insects. Insects are a source of protein, so it could be used to feed that increasing population and it's also worth mentioning that it's normal for some societies, but it has been practiced for a long time in other countries. Producing one kilo of insect protein uses 99.4% less land than one kilo of soy protein. So this could be, again, another novel solution to combat environmental impact and sustainability issues. Insects are rich in protein and fat, which could be another solution to combat these challenges with overfishing and deforestation. <clears throat> and insects are really good, very good for waste management, which could be a good solution, again, to be able to manage and process all of this waste that we produce before it reaches the consumer. With all this said, insect farming industry is in early stages. So there's been a lot of focus on rearing conditions and in mass production. And now we can see that genetics is getting the attention. So with regards to black sturdifly, Black soldier fly has been emerging as a top species for feed, and this is because it valorizes the waste stream, which means that it goes from a waste product with poor nutritional content to a product rich in fat and protein. The appetite for thinking about genetics and breeding is driven by the rapid development of the insect protein sector. There is significant investment in this sector. Barclays estimates that the pace of development will increase and that the whole sector will be worth £8 billion by 2030, with around 25% compound annual growth rate. At the same time, we are also observing rapid differentiation of the sector. There are some very large insect farm companies that have developed vertical integrations to a variable degree. But we are also seeing development of specialized solutions and equipment providers. This is the case particularly here in the UK, where a value chain for insect production is emerging. This value chain is funded by government research and innovation funding through the project called Insectar Insectrial Revolution. This differentiation is similar to other areas of agriculture, where we have clear separations between seed producers, equipment producers and genetic providers. With regards to the insect production system and streamline, this is how it looks like. All the food waste produced is sent to the insect production facility, where the larvae process it converting the waste into a product rich in protein and fat, which are the larvae per se. And then, these larvae are then used as animal feed for farm animals and also for the pet food sector. The byproduct, the frass, 
is then used in crop production as fertilizer. Once the larvae are used in animal feed, the circle begins again. Food processing, waste, larvae processing, animal feed. This is what is referred to as circular economy. With regards to the commercial products, the larvae can be used as live, dried, and it can also be grinded and pressed to produce larvae meal and larvae fat. Moving on, now we're going to focus solely on black soil to fly. Before I start delving into genetics, I'm going to talk about the life cycle and the environment to give some context. Black soil to fly have a short life cycle of around six weeks in which they go through different stages. Starting from the top and clockwise, this is how it looks like. Starting as flies, they mate two days after emergence. Two days after mating and four days after fly emergence, female flies lay eggs. <clears throat> eggs hatch around two to three days after being laid, and once they hatch, they are put immediately into feed. They spend the whole development and growth stage submerged into feed as larvae stage, and the duration can be between around 13 down to 20 days. Once they reach the peak of development, they change color and turn into prepupae, which is an intermediate stage before pupation. For the stage of pupation, what they do is they look for a dry and dark place, and at this stage can take around 14 days. With regards to the environment conditions, we've got different environments in which black sort of fly inhabit, and this is going to depend based on strain and country. And it's also worth mentioning that it's, they're very sensitive to changes in the environment and we'll see how that can be a challenge. So within our nucleus, the general environment conditions that we keep is a temperature of 27 degrees, a humidity between 60 and 70 percent, and our lightning conditions are we use UV lights and we schedule the lightning between off 14 hours on and 10 hours off. Having talked now about the insect sector in general, let's start to move the focus on genetics. Moving from birds to a mammal, in cattle we have seen improvements from a couple of hundreds of kilograms of milk per lactation to easily more than 10,000 kilograms of milk per lactation in modern dairy breeds. Domestication and selective breeding in salmon is more recent and within 10 generations or so we have already seen up to double growth rate. So now that we can see, as an emerging sector, insect breeding programs are often compared to traditional livestock farming, such as poultry, cattle and pigs. However, beyond the foundational components to ensure those genetic gains, insect farming is different. We've got a different life cycle, we can see that it's short. We've got a life cycle that has different stages, as I've mentioned earlier. There's also the fact that flies die after mating, so this would be the same as if we have a cow that calves and then dies. So how are we going to keep track of the pedigree and, and how we're going to keep it through different generations? We cannot do it. We're going to face issues with regards to the pedigree, how to build it and how to keep a log of it. And we also see issues with regards to the fact that insects work better, if not only in groups. There's going to be an effect on egg production, hatch rate, development, growth and feed efficiency. After this introduction, and without taking into account all the challenges for a moment, as we will talk about them later, let's do some speculations on possible genetic gains, but they will not be too drastic. Let's assume that in the wild we get an average 500 larvae per fly, and that the larvae weight 150 mg, and that we get three generations in a year. Under such settings, we will produce a bit more than 200 grams of larvae per original fly. If we now domesticate this population and improve fecundity and survival to 600, growth to 200, and generations per year to 6, we produce a bit more than 700 grams of larvae per original fly. So this is already about 3 times improvement. Now let's assume that selective breeding improved only weight to 300 <clears throat> and generations per year to 8. We would then produce almost 1500 grams of larvae per original fly. This is now doubling based only from selective breeding. We can continue with these calculations, but I'm becoming very speculative here since we need to evaluate realized gains in real breeding facilities, but as you have seen in other species, we can indeed expect large genetic gains. And particularly important point here is that a bit of improvement on a range of traits can start to multiply 
and this is where we will start to see rapid genetic gains in production. With regards to the response to selection on genetic gains, there are different factors affecting it. Selection intensity, accuracy, diversity and time. One needs to be careful when selecting between larvae, since female larvae tend to be larger and heavier, so we can skew sex production if we are not careful. <coughs> if selection intensity is too large, it can happen that we would only select female larvae, and we will see this in a practical example later on. Also, as we move to rapidly growing populations, there could be at the same time an increasing issue with sinking fly mating but also an opportunity because we will always have some flies to mate with. Also, when doing selection, we need to be careful on how we balance selection within and between families so that we avoid losing too much genetic diversity too quickly. There is a lot of theoretical experience on how to manage this, and breeding programs in aquaculture are particularly of interest here since number of progeny pre-family can be of similar magnitude or even higher. All in, while I think that black sunder fly is in a great position for breeding, there is huge fecundity that enables high selection intensity. Hopefully we can reach reasonable accuracy of selection from crunching the generated data. And there seems to be lots of genetic diversity across the globe and generation interval is very short. After some theory, let's move now into some practice. In the insect sector, these are the list of commercially important traits. So what I've done is I've split them into both larvae traits and fly traits. All of these traits come from <clears throat> biology, production, and also from service and industry. So with regards to larvae trait, we've got mass of larvae, development time, growth rate, feed conversion ratio, protein percentage in dry, fat percentage in dry, pupation duration, mass of pre survival, and temperature tolerance. With regards to fly traits, we've got fecundity, hutch rate, resistance to disease, and temperature tolerance. Having mentioned all the list of commercially important traits, here are the traits in which we have most experience with and have developed the most. Mass of larvae, development time, fecundity measured as clutch mass, and survival. Our initial focus have, has been on these traits, as it is what the industry rate needs right now. So what we've done is we have put our focus on the low-hanging fruit. The improvements made in the past year have been focused on the trait definition, the development and improvement of the process, and on the quality of data collection. With regards to the trait definition, we can see on the right the figure with the different stages, and I have placed each trait at the stage in which the phenotype is collected. So mass of larvae is the mass at late larvae stage before pupation and is measured in milligrams. Development time is the time measured in days between hatch and pre pupa emergence. Clutch mass is the weight of a clutch of eggs laid by a single female and is measured in milligrams. And survival rate is the rate of survival from neonates to pre pupation and is measured in percentage. Moving on, we can see here the trait distribution for each of the traits. In order up from left to right, there is mass of larvae, development time, clutch mass and survival rate. With regards to the trait distribution, mass of larvae, development time and clutch months, we can see that they follow a normal distribution. Whereas survival rate, we can see that it's skewed as expected from a rate. Having defined the traits and having shown the distributions, let's move on to the table of the scripted statistics. The first column refers to the trait, and the second column phenotype refers to the level at which the phenotype is collected. The third column is the number of records for that trait. The fourth column is the number of SIP groups that we have. And the fifth column is the mean and standard deviation between brackets. With regards to the fourth column, the number of SIP groups, we have 4,114, and this refers to the pedigree. And I will talk about it on the next slides. From the table shown, mass of larvae is the only trait that the phenotype is collected at individual level compared to the rest of the traits that are collected at group level. We can see this reflected on the third column, where the number of records for mass of larvae is much higher than in the rest of the traits. We can see that the number of records for mass of larvae is higher than 100,000, compared to the development time and survival rate, which the records are less than 500. The last columns are the mean of the traits, which are 
236.2 mg for mass of larvae, 16.1 days for development time, 19 mg for clutch mass, and 93.5% for survival rate. Let's now talk about the pedigree. On this slide we can see three different figures with three different types of pedigree. Figure 1 reflects the complete pedigree, which would be a 1 to 1. Figure 2 reflects an uncertainty of parentage pedigree, in which we've got different groups, four groups in our case, which are selected and then put together in a cage for mating. Figure 3 reflects a group pedigree, in which we select two groups, and we mate females from one group and males from the other group. We work with both pedigrees, uncertainty of parentage and group pedigree, but the analysis done and the results shown on the next slides correspond to the group pedigree. And this is a video of how it looks like. It's a cage with a lot of flies, and we can see how challenging it would be to use the complete pedigree. Here is a table of phenotypic correlations between the traits, with all traits measured at group level. What we can see from the table is that the highest phenotypic correlation is between mass of larvae, measured at late larvae stage, and development time, which also are also unfavorable, meaning that with an increase in mass of larvae, we will also increase development time. The rest of the phenotypic correlations are low and unfavorable between mass of larvae and survival rate, between development time and clutch mass, and between clutch mass and survival rate. However, the phenotypic correlation between mass of larvae and clutch mass is favorable. The phenotypic correlation between development time and survival rate was non-significant. On this slide, we can see four figures reflecting the phenotypic trends across time. On the x-axis, we plot the generation, measured in time, and on the y-axis, we plot the average phenotypic performance. From top left to bottom right, there is mass of larvae, measured at late larvae stage, development time, clutch mass, and survival rate. What we can see from these trends is that we have improved performance in one year in every single trade. The average mass of larvae at late larvae stage has improved from 170 mg to 250 mg approximately. The average development time has improved from 18 days to 16 days. The average clutch mass has improved from 16 mg to 20 mg and the average survival rate has improved from 50% to 95%. How? However, from all of these improvements, how much is genetics and how much is environment? In order to disentangle the genetic from the environment effects, we fitted a univariate genetic model, one for each trait. The model is as follows. We've got the vector of traits, clutch mass, development time, survival rate and mass of larvae. We've got the vector of fixed effects, in which we've got the generation, we have seven generations, and we've got the fixed effect of stage, but this was only fitted for mass of larvae. And we've got three different stages, late larvae, pre pupae and pupae. We have the vector of random effects of cage, we've got 65 number of cages. And we've got the vector of random genetic effect of a sibling group, in which, just as a remainder, that one sibling group equals to one clutch of X. And again, also as a remainder, the number of sibling groups was of 4,114. We've got the vector also of residual effects. The variance component estimations were obtained by Subword Blob F90 family of programs. After fitting the model, here are the results of the variance component estimation measured as ratio. The first column we have the traits. On the second column we have the phenotypic variance. On the third column we have the ratio of the group variance to the phenotypic variance which would be our genetic component. On the fourth column we have the ratio of cage variance to phenotypic variance. And on the fifth and last column we have the ratio of residual variance to phenotypic variance. From the results obtained we can see that the highest effect is due to the residual, which are those environment effects we don't account for. The effect of the cage is low, but is constant across all the traits. The group effect is highest for mass of larvae than the rest of the traits, and this is explained by the fact that the phenotype is collected at individual level, 
and we can account for both within and between family variation compared to the rest of the traits in which we cannot account for within family variation. The group effect for mass of larvae is 42%, for development time is 11%, and for clutch mass is 3%, which is low but is expected as it is a fertility trait. What these results show us is that the highest improvements are going to come from improvements in mass of larvae. With regards to survival rate, the group effect is basically zero. This could be due to the trait distribution, as it is skewed and it should be normalized to fit the genetic analysis. It can also show that we need to look at the data collection, as we have seen that the rates go above 100%. Or it can also be that the group effect is zero and there is actually no genetic, no effect due to genetics. On these next slides, I'm going to mention some of the main challenges we face. One challenge is trait definition. One example is the definition of development time. If you talk to different industries, every one of them is going to give you a different definition of what the trait is and at what stage the phenotype is collected. There needs to be a standardization across the industry so we can all be on the same page. We face the issue about group versus individual performance. It is very difficult to phenotype at individual level, <clears throat> as we've seen. We can keep the individual separate, but the performance will drop and it's not going to be sustainable on the long term. We've also seen that the individuals, the larvae, are submerging feed during the whole cycle until pupation, so that's going to be very difficult to be able to phenotype at individual level. It's also to mention that they need to be kept as a group during the life cycle <clears throat> and at a minimum population size, <clears throat> otherwise the population will not work on the following generation and again it's not sustainable on the long term. There's also challenges with regards to management of genetic diversity and inbreeding. So we know that insects tolerate high rates of inbreeding. However, at what rate it becomes detrimental, there's still work to be done in that area. We also face issues with regards to the environment. As I mentioned earlier, they're very sensitive to changes in substrate temperature and humidity, and we've had issues with the three of them. Just to give a quick example, so we've had issues with the substrate in which we ended up with populations with low survival rate and also low mass. We've had issues with temperature in which the, in which the flies wouldn't lay eggs, and we've had issues with humidity in which the pupae wouldn't emerge as flies. There's also challenges with regards to male to female ratio and sizes. So we know and we've seen that females are bigger than males. And this can affect selection if we only select for individual mass at late larvae stage with a strong selection intensity within a family. And we're going to see on the next slides. It's also worth mentioning that a cage won't perform well if there's a big difference in the ratio between male and females. So here what we don't want is cages in which we've got 80% females, 20% males and vice versa. We also face challenge with regards to sex dimorphism in larvae stage, so we are unable to differentiate between male and female under the fly stage, and that can become a problem with regards to doing selections and with regards to obtaining a phenotype based on the different sexes. After having mentioned the different challenges we faced, I'm going to introduce technology and strategies that can inform us and can be used to combat some of those challenges. One strategy that can be used is simulations. We have simulated a standard breeding program for the trade mass of larvae measured at late larvae stage. We have no sex information before crossing and selections. The population simulated was of 200 groups with 500 larvae per group during a period of six years and there has been between and within family selection. In the figure on the right we can see on the x-axis the generation, the time, and on the y-axis the genetic gains obtained across that time. The first year in black refers to the burn-in. The rows show the different proportion of phenotyped individuals and the columns show the different proportion of selected individuals. However, there is one graph, the one on the bottom left, in which we're not able to achieve response to selection after a certain time. 
This is due to a high intensity of selection within a family and the challenge that we face with females being larger than males. From the results, we can obtain three main things. One, a standard breeding program works and we can generate response to selection across time. Two, the response to selection can be optimized by having different proportion of phenotyped individuals and different proportion of selected individuals within a family. And third, if there is a high intensity of selection within family, the breeding program will not be sustainable on the long term. Here we can see an example of how the difference in mass between males and females affects the response to selection across time. On the right, we can see the distribution of the trait mass of larvae at late larvae stage. Females are 15% bigger than males, and we can see this on the figure. The distribution of the trait for males is in color green, and the distribution of the trait for females is in color yellow. In a scenario within a high intensity of selection within a family, given these differences, we can see how, across time, even though that here we only plot three generations, the distribution between males and females shift and we end up selecting more females each generation. Another way to view it is with these plots on the simulations. We have three plots. The first one in black, which shows the burn-in. The second one in blue, which shows a scenario with low intensity of selection within family. And the third one in green, which shows a scenario with high intensity of selection within family. On the x-axis, we show the accumulative number of cages across time, and on the y-axis, we show the proportion of females in within a cage, which each dot be in a cage. The cloud of dots refer to the proportion of females after selections are done. What we observe is that in a scenario with low intensity of selection, the figure in blue, across time and for all cages, the proportion of females in within a cage doesn't go above 60 to 65 percent. However, if we observe the scenario with high intensity of selection, the one in green, across time and for all cages, the proportion of females in within a cage is higher than 60 to 65 percent, achieving proportions of 90 to 100 percent in a high number of cages. Besides, we also observe for this scenario that the number of accumulative cages is lower, indicating the population clashing are not being viable on the long term. Another challenge mentioned was the sensitivity to the environment. We have heard reports that some strains seem to perform quite differently in different environments. But let's first think how is environment defined for black soldierfly, particularly for larvae. This can be driven by climate, substrate and the microbiome of the substrate. There has been quite some research in this space from a technological perspective. I personally am looking forward to more reports from the genetic perspective to evaluate how much genotype by environment interactions is there. If there is a large genotype by environment interaction, we need to assess first if this is just scale genotype by environment interaction, which does not impact our selections too much. Or is it a crossover genotype environment interaction? which is tricky to deal with, but we do have methods from both animal and plant breeding that we can leverage here. And lastly, I will talk a little bit about the future of insect breeding and how it can look like. So the main focus should be on three different areas, which are phenotyping tools, quantitative genetics and selections, and genomics. And with regards to phenotyping tools, we need to be able to improve standard phenotyping methods, and develop non-destructive methods for hard-to-measure traits with the use of phenomics. With regards to quantitative genetics and selections, we need to be able to hone those quantitative genetics and selection methods to estimate economic weights for the traits, to evaluate genotype by environment interactions, as mentioned earlier, and to evaluate breed complementarity and heterosis for the purpose of using also, as an example, crossbreeding for IP protection. With regards to genomics, we should be focusing on or working towards assessing a worldwide genome diversity and build a pan-genome. 
build a training populations for GWAS and genomic selections, and also genome editing. With all this said, thank you everyone for listening. And before I finish, I would like to thank both Peter Box team and the Roslin Institute team, in which, without their help and their effort, none of this would have been possible. All right, thank you so much, Maria. Uh, you're welcome to go ahead and turn on your uh, camera and mic. We can start with some questions. Um, I'll just go ahead and get started, Brenda, while you get oriented, and I'll hand it back to you. Um, there was one question that came in that I think is maybe relevant for, for everyone um, on the call. Um, so, uh, and I think you kind of alluded to this as well, or, or you, you mentioned this at the end. So. Um, can you speak a little bit about this question is from Wayne. Uh, can you speak about your the research on the gut micro microbiome or potential endosymbionts and how might um, these be exploited to increase, for instance, protein content and also resistance to pathogens? Okay, well, thank you for, for thank you for the question. Um, we're looking into it. Uh, we yet haven't done much about it and. Um, to be honest, well, I'm not the expert about microbiome. We do have a team in like R&D, there it is. And um, we're looking into it, but definitely there's something, uh, there's gonna be some interactions there that we could use to then, you know, we can use different, um, we can, or define different environments and select for. But right now, like I kind of, I kind of give an answer because as it's yet to be explored. I think the first steps would be to work with different diets you know, work with different environments based on temperature, humidity, then move to, you know, just move to a list of things and like start working, as I mentioned earlier, in the low hanging fruit first. And then, uh, but it's a really good um, topic to work in R&D, that for sure. Hi, Murray. Uh, great talk. And we have a question from Meg Allen um, that uh, she questions the the quality of the proteins and, and BSF larvae, pupae, mm -hmm. adults. Uh, th are they suitable for human digestion? And she asked this question because she's tried to feed them to uh, several predator organisms and she gets a lot of different results. Okay, well... Um, just to say that uh, now for a start, we don't, we don't work with human food with us, you know, for human food. So we get all the research that we've done. We haven't done any on human digestion. So I kind of, I don't know how relevant it is. Like, I don't have the answer for that question. Maybe Meg can talk to you directly. About yeah. That. that would be good. Uh, we've got another question from Elena Faccini. Uh, what do you mean uh, with the term group pedigree, can you elaborate on that? Yes. So with regards to the group pedigree, what I mean is uh, we've got um, one group and that groups we've got flies in which they're gonna be males and females. So what we do is we select females from one group and then we select males from a different group and then we put them all in one cage. So that's what it means of uh, a group pedigree. Okay. All right, Krista, I'm gonna let you take over and I'll jump off here. All right, perfect. So I, th I think we've got maybe time for two more quick ones and then and then yeah. we'll uh, So um, one from Brian that just came in, uh, do any of your teams study different feed steps for insects? So, so for example, using flies to break down different weights, products that are difficult to manage um, by other means. Yeah, so right now we've got, like I said, with, the, with regards to different environments, where one of the first one would be with different diets. So we've got, we're working with the uh, chick rum. We've got also like brewer's grains, um, fruit and vegetables, and uh, different ways uh, also to be, like right now, because we're in the UK and because of uh, like legislation, there's some type like waste that we cannot, we cannot use, but definitely is something that uh, we're looking on because it's um, what I was saying, you can have different products and you can have different products that can be for specific clients. There's a lot of waste management, so you can look for a, or breed for a strain that is really good at uh, that. Uh, with regards to maybe a protein producer, that the only thing that I would like for the breeding objective objective would be to have high protein content instead of just having a larvae that, for example, is just going through feed for a long period of time, so you can get rid of that waste. 
but yeah, we, we are working on it. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I'm going to do this one more question. Then you have more coming in the, in the Q and a, so maybe, uh, you can, oh, okay. you can those two as well. So, but the last one we'll answer live is from faith. So is there a likelihood, uh, or what's the likelihood of having aflatoxins from the feed from insect feed? So I'm guessing what she means is if you feed, uh, grains that have mycotoxins in them, what is, what's the likelihood that that's going to get transmitted okay. from the insect? So we've done some uh, some preliminary work on that, but I know from different research that it uh, depends on what toxins they are, like insects and black the fly, they can, um, they eat it and then they eliminate it. So when you get the product, you're not going to get the insect with, uh, with that, um, with that toxin. Again, I'm pretty sure it just, it depends on, you know, maybe the strain you're looking at or the toxin you're looking at, but I know they are able to do and uh, to digest it. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's actually one a topic that ARS has a working group in that we are also interested in, in the bioremediation of, of mycotoxins. So um, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Maria. And uh, we're on now to our final speaker. Um, uh, again, keep your questions coming and, and she should be able to see those in the Q&A and she can respond to those um, uh, directly. Um, so moving on to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Alida Espinosa is a research entomologist at EnviroFlight, where she leads a team that conducts research on black soldier fly breeding and genetics. She's originally from Dallas, Texas, and received her PhD in entomology at Texas A&M University. And we're so happy to have her. I'm going to hand it now over to Brenda, who will play her video. Uh, thanks so much. Hello, today I will be talking to you about EnviroFlight uh, and what we do. So my name is Elida Spinoza. I am an entomologist focusing on the genetics R&D research that we're doing at EnviroFlight. And I'll be talking to you about creating an effective breeding program for the black soldier fly, Hermitia lucens. So the world's population reached 8 billion people on November 15, 2022, and these numbers continue to increase. Uh, by 2050, we're expecting 9.7 billion people, and by 2100, we're expecting 10.4 billion people. So these numbers uh, have a significant impact on our planet in several ways. So a lot of that can be related to habitat destruction, loss of biodiversity, an overall increased demand of our resources, which is what's going to bring about some of those issues. Uh, these researches in, uh, resources include food, water, energy, and land. So for example, by 2050, uh, we're expected to have an increased demand in animal-derived protein. We're expecting it to more than double, putting a significant pressure on the planet's resources and ecosystem. So addressing these challenges will require concerted efforts to promote sustainable development and reduce the ecological footprint of our human activities. Thus, we're left with an urgent call to action. And the United States have outlined uh, the sustainable development goals and the world's, as the world's best plan to improve the health of our planet. So the sustainable development goals uh, outlined 17 different goals. These were adopted in 2015 as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They're intended to guide and coordinate international development efforts for the next 15 years so that we can aim to achieve sustainable and a more equitable future by 2030. So really great endeavor, a lot of, a lot of big ideas. Um, um, put together within these goals. And they offer a lot of common targets consistent throughout them. So there's a wide range of sustainable development issues, including poverty, hunger, health, education, gender equality, clean energy, climate action, and more. So each goal has specific targets and indicators to measure the progress of that goal they're all interconnected and interdependent. So usually achieving one is going to help um, the achievement of another. And overall, it's a very holistic and integrated approach to 
ensuring that we have the sustainable infrastructure for the future. And insects play a, a really interesting role in how they can benefit and add to these goals. So the production of insects as food and feed are really creating this innovative market in the agricultural landscape. So they have the potential of helping our planet in many ways, especially when managed responsibly. So for starters, they're a high nutritional value, rich source of protein, healthy fats and vitamins for both animals and humans. Um, insects like the black soldier fly shown in this picture here, crickets, mealworms, they've all shown to be similar or higher uh, in protein content than some of your conventional meats like beef and pork. And they're going to require less resources in terms of feed and water uh, for us to grow them. Uh, there's also the possibility of them decreasing waste by recycling byproducts and uh, using them as a way to, to feed and rear these insects. For example, the envirobug, our premium dried soldier, blight, uh, soldier fly larva, um, is fed diet composed of pre-consumer byproduct. Um, and I know that the, the commercial facilities around the world are, are using similar byproducts or, or food waste to, to rear their insects. So by promoting the consumption of insects, uh, we can also help protect and conserve biodiversity um, and reduce the pressure that it might have on our natural resources. So again, I do believe insects offer a promising solution for promoting sustainable food systems uh, and reducing the ecological footprint of our food and feed production. At EnviroFlight, uh, we specialize in the sustainable production of high quality animal and plant nutrients derived from these different insect ingredients uh, and really harness this insect technology. So the company was founded in 2009. Um, and for the past four years, uh, we have dedicated ourselves to rearing high quality black soldier fly larva at the first US commercial scale facility in the United States. Uh, yeah, so again, we are hoping we're contributing and to addressing this growing uh, global demand for food and feed while reducing the environmental impact of agriculture. And how we're doing that is by micro farming the black soldier fly larva at an industrial scale. So we use the black soldier fly larva to convert organic waste into a nutrient rich protein source. Um, this process is highly efficient, has a lower environmental impact then your conventional feedstock farming requires less water, land, feed, and resources, um, produces fewer greenhouse gas emissions. And we're committed to advancing the sustainable food systems and promoting a more circular economy uh, for really regenerative approach uh, to agriculture. So every day uh, we're doing research, we're doing the production um, to ultimately maximize the sustainability opportunities that are offered by the unique biology of the black soldier fly. And as a part of that, what we're doing is developing a breeding program uh, where we can focus on accelerating specific traits within the populations that we have. We know that this offer, offers a very powerful tool for improving the quality, productivity, and adaptability of our black soldier fly populations. So history has shown um, that there are great gains to be made uh, with the strategic breeding program uh, in terms of increasing productivity. So terrestrial livestock species have shown one to 5% gains per generation still to this date, uh, despite um, these animals being selected for, for the past uh, several decades. Aquaculture species, there's a, a bit of a greater range there. And I think a lot of that has to do with with the specific species and the, the taxonomic breath that we're talking about. You have arthropods, you have fish and, and all kinds of stuff there. But here we see a 10 to 20% gain per generation. And a lot of this is associated with traits relative to growth, how um, the rate at which animals are consuming feed, the nutrition, uh, nutrient retention, the size of these animals, survival, the quality, so quality, typically in terms of the product, the ultimate product that's being produced, 
you think about meat, you think about texture, coloration, reproduction, um, in terms of the fecundity, the overall size of the progeny, uh, the progeny group, uh, your litter population, uh, the and then the sexual maturation of those individuals um, that are going to produce that next generation. So keeping this in mind, uh, I've outlined here, I think, some of the fundamental factors that create an effective breeding program. And a lot of this is associated with the genetics of the individual. Because one, we want to make sure that our populations have a variation in phenotypes and that those that variation is due to genetic variation um, so that those traits are heritable and that we can select for them. We need to be able to manage and monitor the life history of a population um, and collect data tracking individuals or tracking different um, populations over the course of time and, and really building to the data set that we have and, and how we understand uh, their life history. And finally, we need to be able to define what quality traits are uh, within our industry and for our insects uh, or for our given animal. Um, so with all of these factors defined, there are certain questions that come to mind as we begin to establish breeding programs. And I think some of those focus on three different things. The first one, genetic diversity. So what are the animals that are going to make up our breeding population and what is their genetic heterogeneity? Breeding skill and inbreeding rates. How big of a population are we going to be working with and how is the relatedness uh, going to accumulate within those populations over time as we continue to select for them? And then monitoring the health and diversity. So, so really bringing that full circle um, and establishing and continuously collecting data to ensure that we have a healthy, we have a diverse um, population and that that's not changing too much or at least accounting for what's changing over time. So again, the outline tackling some some ideas here within these these three um, questions of genetic diversity, breeding scale and the monitoring of that over time. So genetic diversity, our aims are to establish a black soldier fly base population, measure the genetic diversity in a black soldier fly population, and establish the black soldier fly uh, lines from this designated black soldier fly base population. So how do we determine that? What do we look at? And upon establishing, can we avoid uh, limiting the allelic variation, which we'll have to play with for the selection of these animals? So we start off with uh, the base population, right? So again, who is it going to be? So we target a population, sample individuals, collect DNA, and then genotype these using a black soldier fly SNP panel uh, to better understand that genetic or to better assess that genetic variation. And upon doing that, uh, we obtain some results. Uh, and we'll be looking at two specific indices and values uh, for how to do this. So it being a SNP panel by allelic set of SNPs, our maximum value of index or of diversity here is 0 0.5. So typically when we have a population with greater than 0 0.25 score, uh, that means we're kind of within a good range of uh, genetic diversity. If that population happens to be more inbred, with more highly related individuals, you're going to see that number decrease and be closer um, to zero because, again, they're more similar to each other. And then also we have relatedness um, values within the population. And so you can think of this as, you know, the, the sharing of the genetic makeup uh, between full sibs or offspring, typically 50%. Uh, so you don't want a lot of increased relatedness, especially if you have a population that you're hoping to to continuously breed with each other. And within the base population, we wanted uh, to see kind of where where these stood. Um, so our base population that we designated, our diversity index was 0 0.372. Remember that number. So uh, it's 
good amount greater than 0 0.25, closer to that 0 0.5 maximum. This is a healthy population with a good diversity score. And then in terms of relatedness, this is very close to zero. Um, so very low relatedness, so like really further testifying the low inbreeding that we're having within this population. And so next we wanted to determine whether we could di differentiate different um, black soldier fly lines from this base population. So in this experiment, we started with that base population um, and then we established three different populations separately, uh, rearing those separately and driving some selection separately. Um, we targeted a specific trait associated with harvest size and hatchability of the eggs of these populations uh, and measured these at generation three. Uh, so not generation six, generation three. Um, and then compared those results. So by generation three, uh, we are not uh, seeing any differentiable pop populations despite having bred these groups uh, separately for three generations. Uh, and then when we compare their specific diversity index scores um, to that of the base population, they haven't changed too much. We do see a slight decrease. And then specifically within the lines that we're comparing or among the lines that we're comparing, uh, we see more or less um, equal types of values. Now, I will bring to attention uh, this FST score of less than 0 0.5 between all lines. We'll be talking and using this, this F statistic uh, in the rest of the presentation. So this is a, the fixation index where we measure the population genetic structure describing differentiation amongst populations. So we use it as a way to compare one population to another and relate um, the whole population. Um, I guess the total populations and, and how they compare in terms of diversity relative to each other. So this index can usually range from zero to one, zero indicating that there's no genetic differentiation. So here, less than 0 0.5, very close to zero. Uh, and we see no genetic differentiation, especially as illustrated uh, in this PCOA. So anything greater than uh, 0 0.15 FST value is usually going to indicate some moderate levels of differentiation. So not only are we measuring gene diversity uh, within a population, uh, but we're also comparing these values and we're comparing uh, them using this F statistic. So our next question was, okay, we couldn't see differentiation at gener generation three. Uh, what about after generation six? So could we establish separate populations, breed those separately, target a selected trait, continue to propagate those, and then come in at generation six and genotype those individuals? And so that's what we did. And by generation six, we were able to see a separation uh, in the lines and establish that they are genetically differentiable. So here the F statistic, it's at 0 0.17. So also illustrated within this, uh, the, within our graph, you can see the clustering of these two different lines. Uh, so again, genetically differentiable by generation six um, as we draw selection here. And then if we look at the gene diversity index, um, still moderately good, uh, especially compared to our base population from which we started. So good stuff that we're working with. Those high levels of diversity are maintained um, despite these uh, selection efforts for six generations. So now in terms of breeding scale and inbreeding rates. Uh, what we wanted to do is restrict the number of mating animals. So change that population size and see how that would impact the genetic diversity, relatedness, um, ultimately really looking at inbreeding rates and kind of how those change within the scales that we might be working with. So we tested small, medium, large. Uh, small being our lab scale, working with hundreds of black soldier flies, uh, populations and, or 
populations made up of hundreds of black soldier flies, intermediate scale this population with thousands of black soldier flies, and then finally our commercial scale with millions of black soldier flies. So three very different scales from which we uh, created populations from that same base population. We reared these populations separately, um, selecting this these targeted traits, harvest size, and after nine generations, we genotyped them and compared. So here we found uh, some genetic differentiation and really more so with the lab scale, um, which is more or less expected given that uh, we're working with the relatively smaller size of individuals to propagate between each um, generation. FST value for that differentiation was 0 0.24. So all scales maintained a high levels of diversity and we could see that here. Um, however, those are uh, progressively decreasing as we decrease uh, our scale. So with the laboratory scale having the lowest genetic diversity there, again, relative to um, each other and then relative to the base population. Now, in terms of relatedness, uh, here I'm introducing this relatedness curve. And so we can think about this relatedness curve in terms of variables consisting of allelic variation in the number of individuals in the population. So using the distribution of the given population, we begin to characterize the relatedness in each population and can compare those to each other. So relatedness uh, between the farm and intermediate scale remains similar. And we know this because our overall distribution, the shape of the curve is very similar. Um, and then if we look at the shape of the curve for the distribution of relatedness for the laboratory scale, we can see it has a, a wider range, which is indicative of more related individuals and hence higher inbreeding rates. So a little different between the two. Um, also, the difference in peak um, gives us a little bit information about some of the differentiation between the population. So we see that illustrated in this relatedness curve, but then also in the PCA uh, from before. So monitoring for health and diversity. How does genetic heterogeneity change over time in a selected population? So this is really important for the progression of a breeding program. We have to be able to monitor the populations we're selecting on and we have to be able to consistently relate that to the observations of phenotypes that we're seeing. So how is how are these propagations relating to the health, the phenotypes, our target phenotypes, and then ultimately providing some type of qualitative measure, um, excuse me, quantitative measure to, to better understand what's happening. So here I provide an example. So we have BSF line four from before. So this was a line reared at the laboratory scale, uh, which in turn resulted in high selection intensity as shown earlier, especially relative to your commercial farm rearing and the intermediate, intermediate rearing. So what we saw here, um, after 17 generations is considerable reduction in diversity. And I'll show this by going through several indices um, that we tracked. So population and generation, so BSF line four at generation six, we have 0 0.330 diversity index. Again, that's a good number, our relatedness close to zero. And then our observed versus expected heterozygosity, exactly the same. So we don't expect any inbreeding to be happening at this level. Uh, but then when we reach generation 23, after 17 generations, we see a decrease in that diversity index. So now we're at 0 0.26. Again, based on what we said before uh, about the the typical range uh, and the meaning of those numbers greater than 0 0.25 isn't bad. Uh, it's good. It's a healthy population or indicative of a healthy population. However, now we look at relatedness. So some of our other um, indices, we see that here relatedness is 0 0.45. So again, 
That means that this relatedness is approaching mean values of full siblings. These individuals are very related within this population. Um, and then the observed versus expected heterozygosity is lower, again, attesting to inbreeding happening within this population. So this was a bit interesting and, and really put into perspective the idea of population structure. So how is it that the gene diversity greater than 0.25, again, as a rule of thumb, assumed to be good, uh, is yielding these high inbreeding rates and these high relatedness values. And so a lot of it has to do ultimately with the size of that population and not the sampled or the census population size, but the effective population size. So the expected number of contributing of individual or individuals that are contributing variation um, in the average of the of the allelic variation within that population. So when we looked at that, the effective population size of this group is actually closer to 3.2, despite us having hundreds of individuals in there. And um, I mean, that essentially means that full siblings or close to full siblings are mating with each other. So there's really not a lot of genetic variation that's happening. So this is an artifact uh, that should really be associated with the gene diversity index and how that's calculated. So once we're once we have uh, a population with really essentially less than three individuals contributing to it, we can't necessarily um, attribute gene diversity index to heterozygosity because mating is really not 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 a random anymore and so this is this is really something to consider and and i think further emphasizes the importance of looking at different elements that better characterize and define the population structure of your populations so conclusions and implications populations are genetically differentiable at generation six but not generation three um and these were all sorts from the base population which means that you have a good baseline for maintaining and developing different selected lines. All breeding skills were maintained at this greater than 0 0.25 through generation nine, uh, which is really great considering they're very different scales. Um, and we specifically chose these scales because we do find them to be relevant to lab experiments that we're conducting. I'm sure that other people are conducting um, especially at that scale, and then also the commercial farm scale production. Um, so you can successfully select traits if managed properly without sacrificing genetic diversity. And that's the goal of a breeding program. So to avoid some of those foreseeable plateaus in the exploitable genetic variation um, so that we can continue to achieve further gains. Overall, the genetic diversity measures indicate that all breeding populations tested maintain this high level of genetic diversity just as a whole. However, as we saw in that last example, uh, we cannot only monitor genetic diversity alone. So relatedness, inbreeding, these F statistics, they're really going to provide further characterization of that population genetic structure and help us improve how we decide to breed the lines that we have. The black soldier fly really lends itself um, to this high intensity selection. And I think this is really inherent of any type of insect farming or arthropod propagation that's going to happen um, due to their higher fecundity and shorter life cycle. So the same reasons why we love to farm them, they produce a lot, they produce fast, are the same reasons uh, that they might uh, be a little bit more finicky to work with. But again, if a breeding program strategizes and manages well, I think uh, we have a lot of potential to really effectively establish um, a lot of the desirable traits that we want to see in these products. So 
All of this has really served as a foundation for the breeding program and the continued research that we're doing here at EnviroFlight. We're currently developing different lines and families with high performance traits, uh, really for increased insect ingredient production. So at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that we're producing more insects, bigger, better larvae, uh, so that we continue to meet the demand um, of our food production systems. We're testing multiple breeding strategies to achieve faster rates of improvement and developing biomarkers to more accurately identify quality traits. So tie some of that in with the phenotypes and, and other ways to index or measure um, the traits that we're trying to look for. So we hope to continue creating many varieties of black soldier flies with characteristics desired by our consumers, but more importantly, those that will really make the black soldier fly adaptable to various environments, whether that's a different feed or, you know, being reared in a different country. And the idea, it's like, hey, let's take the black soldier fly to market. So we have successfully selected, amplified, and established lines within the lab, taken them to the commercial scale, and currently uh, within our lines of production. So we hope to continue to do this and continue to really um, contribute to the efforts of uh, achieving our global food security for the years to come. So many thanks to EnviroFlight, the organizers of this symposium. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to share this research with you, and then also thank you for all the funding um, that contribute to creating great spaces and great organizations that care about the value of arthropod genomics and the impact it has on, on a lot of really big issues. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Alita. Thank you all again to all of our speakers. This has been a really wonderful um, symposium. I hope everyone else will join me in, in thanking them all for their time. Um, I would like to get to a couple questions for Alita. Um, I'm going to ask, because I have my take my privilege, I'm going to ask my question first, if that's okay. So I'm curious if you or others have noticed have, have there been efforts to measure inbreeding depression in black soldier flies so is it known that that they suffer from certain you know loss of uh, or um, that certain traits decrease favorable change decrease with with increased inbreeding yeah so i think it's it's going to be typical of just general patterns of our understanding of inbreeding depressions with some of these specific lines and i didn't mention that but i'll mention it now um, so that BSF line four that we were talking about, it actually ended up crashing three generations later. So at generation 26, um, obviously high inbreeding rates. And along with that, we had observed some phenotypes that were not targeted phenotypes that we would want. You know, smaller flies typically is one of the first things that you start noticing. But definitely, I think there are associated inbreeding depressions um, that are going on with those increased inbreeding rates. Okay, and um, I'm going to be selfish and ask you a question right now. There are a few more questions in the chat box, but uh, can you talk more about your SNP panel and what genome you're using, uh, that, inf that kind of information? Yeah, so a lot of the, the SNP panel was developed from a publicly available genome. So this was the genome available at the time, um, and I can provide a, a specific uh, citation for that um, in, the, in the question answer in a bit. But yeah, it's a general um, black soldier fly genome that was available, and this was actually prior to the most recent genome that was avail uh, became available, I think, as of 2020. So I know there's better genomes out there for like maybe better development of another panel, but the panel itself was a low density panel. So, so not a, um, a higher density panel. We're talking about maybe 500 SNPs and it provided enough breadth, I guess, for us to be able to, to quantify the population. Um, we developed it using our own flies. Um, so it's, they are based, it is based on the, on the genetics of the, the flies that we're working with. But I'm sure is, is it commercially <laughs> available or did you do that custom? Uh, we did that custom, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
there is a question in the Q and A about uh, this is from Faith Kamanzi. Uh, she would like to know how you determine production cost of the insect for feed. Um, and this could actually be a general question for the panel as well. Uh, but uh, if you want to speak to that, yeah. So for starters. I think I mentioned, you know, the responsible management of production. And I think that's one of the, like, it's a great question because that's how we begin to do that. So we need to quantify what all goes into the production cost um, because ultimately those are resources that we're using, resources that we're uh, paying for. And uh, we try to account for energy, you know, the power that it takes to maintain a facility, the water that's used in, in, rearing the everyday rearing that we do and just the everyday management of our production facility and our research facilities too. So we really try to have or encompass as, as much as we can account for to what that production cost is. Okay, thank you. I think in the time that we have left, uh, we can invite, uh, I, I see the, the insect team uh, uh, here and if we can invite Maria to come back on. Uh, we can ask you some general questions and you can you can address them or not. It's totally up to you. Uh, but I asked you a general question to think about, and that is, what are you targeting for your these insects that you have in production? Do you have specific uh, products in mind or specific animal feed in mind? That kind of information, if you can give it, uh, if it's proprietary, that's okay. Uh, so, uh, Ali, why don't you do, uh, address that first? Okay, if you want. Uh, yeah, I can say that uh, we address feed and food uh, markets. And with uh, our fresh insects, we can also uh, address the, the plant fertilizer. It's a very interesting market also, the products. But it's for feed and food, different kind of species, aquacultures so of fish, uh, chicken. Uh, swine also, human, of course. Okay. All this kind Great. of uh, market. Yeah. Great. Any, any, the other two of you want to comment on that? I listed out some of the products that we produce, and a lot of it is focused on um, animal feed. So, definitely for the feed sector side of things, we have the EnviroBug, which is the whole bug itself. But then we can turn that into um, meal or by pressing it. And then that's what produces the oil. So somebody asked about how we produce the Enviro oil, but it's it's a press product from the Enviro book. So it's it's all coming from the insect. We also have frass also. I think there's multiple potential uses there, not just for um, for animal feed, there's a potential there, but there's also for for plant use and plant nutrition. Okay, Maria? Yeah, so um, just to be a little bit um, different than the rest of um, of the speakers, what we do is we do, we supply with the genetics. So we, what we do is we supply eggs. So we've got different products and we just give the eggs to protein producers or to waste management, or if they want for feed for chickens or for fish. So it's just like a little, like a step back from it. So we just, we have the, different products, different genetics, <clears throat> and based on who wants it, we give one product or the other one. Okay. Right. And Kristen, I think you had uh, a question. I'll let you go ahead and ask <clears throat> that. Yeah. So um, I'm very curious, and I think some some folks have mentioned it. So I'm a, a pathologist at heart, and I'm, so I'm very curious about the plans that uh, your companies have for exploring disease or pathogen resistance. And so is this a priority for everyone? And if it's not, what are why are the reasons for? And I gave an example of is there low pathogen risk in your systems? Um, I know Maria, you had mentioned taking the low hanging fruit first. Is yeah. it because it's low hanging fruit? So I wanted to open that up to you all. So I could start with that. Um, but yeah, for now we haven't seen any. We know there's some. There can be some diseases, or but right now we haven't seen any of that in our facilities. We do have um, measurements like pest control. Uh, but definitely if we see this that it arises, that would be something to include in the breeding objective and something to select against for or develop methods to be able to incorporate. 
in our selection methods. It's ex exactly the same uh, answers for us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, probably the same. I think we're lucky that so far, at least within the rearing of the Black soldier fly, we haven't come up um, against any harmful pathogens. I know that's not the case for some of the other insects uh, that we breed. The cricket, which isn't really accounted for here, but I'm sure that that's kind of where you're speaking from. Um, so I think there is a need, and, and I'd rather be... Um, have it be a preventative effort than a proactive effort like once we have an issue so there's there's definitely a need and and i appreciate anybody working on it and i i, I just don't think it's something that we're specifically targeting right now and we have a question from wayne again and i think this is a really good general question for you all to address because i'm sure you're all facing this um, and it'll be interesting how you answer this because Ellie, you're in the US and the others are in, in the EU. Uh, what are the regulatory roadblocks to g getting a product commercialized? Um, so if you'd like to speak to that. Uh, I can maybe start on that. Uh, I'm not a specialized on, the, <laughs> on this kind of area, but uh, I know that at least for me, worms, then we have received the authorization for the market, for human market also. But, uh, for human? For human, yeah. That's great. Yeah, today the regulation is much more, um, the, the main focus and now is on the, the feed that we can provide for, for insects. So this, this is the main difference between both uh, uh, countries, yeah, between the different countries. Yeah, I think in the U.S., it, the insects are still considered grass uh, as far as the regulatory agencies. I don't know if that's going to change uh, at some point, but if, if uh, Ellie, you could speak to that as far as if there's any, I'm sure that you've got people in, uh, in the Darling group that are looking at that. Yeah, and actually in viral flight, um, we have spent some, some good efforts making sure that we have AFCO definitions. So not just via the, the grass dossier aspect of things, but define some of these insect products and insect ingredients within those animal feed definitions for AFCO. And so all of that is a process that's ultimately regulated by the FDA. And so we do have to follow that through that. And, and with that here, again, I think specifically in the United States, there's some differences in and what those are at the state level and what they are at the federal level. So with a lot of things, there's some nuance there and depending on, on what the state um, regulations and acceptance of a, of a feed ingredient might be, um, we do have to have continued communication with those state regulators as much as we are you know, striving to define these products at the federal level. And Maria, I think you probably have a different kind of regulation, or do you have regulation and 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 you know provide providing your products to other animal farms or, or insect farms? Yes. Now, for us, as we provide eggs, we do need to go through regulatory checks for a, from a vet. So, from, with regards to the product, given that that's the only one. Um, I think that for now is that one. I think the most would be because of the being in the UK because of Brexit is those constraints with regards to maybe to sending it or to shipping because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of lot of regulations also to send and, and get products. But uh, with regards to that, it would be veterinary regularly veterinary checks. Yeah. Okay. All right, and I guess finally, I if you guys, I don't know if you're meeting for the first time or if you already know each other, but if you have questions for each other, I'd open it up to that. I just would like to say that it has been great, like both uh, both of the presentations there have been amazing. And uh, I, I have seen some of the Enviroflight in the AAP last year. So it's, it's always nice to see it again. But yeah, it was just uh, to congratulate also the rest of the speakers for the work. Yeah, same. I think uh, it's very interesting, the approach uh, at which we're tackling a very similar conversation. And I think uh, 
we're all have very good ideas and strategies of about how we're looking at at the genetics and the breeding programs that we're establishing for insects. So it's really cool. I'm enjoying it. And now we are in the same Slack uh, channel, so we can discuss on this kind of uh, yeah this sure. kind of tool. <laughs> That's true. And that that kind of, I think we're at the end of our time and that kind of brings us to the wrap up. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the, uh, to the speakers for the time that you spent and invested in this. I think it's really important that we get the word out because I still encounter people that say, uh, why would you want to eat insects? <laughs> so they don't get it and, and, and we need to communicate better. And I'll give Kristen the last word here and then we'll go to Brad for the wrap up. Great, well, thanks everyone who stuck with us this two hours, but I thought, I think it's well worth, a, well worth um, the, the time. And thanks again, as Brenda said, to all of our speakers. Um, and we will see you next time. Brad, I don't know if you wanted to announce the next session, um, but otherwise I will oh, leave it there. Sorry. Certainly. Um, just yeah, a reminder to check out the website. Um, the next session is on April 7th, the same time. Um, if you register for this session, you are already uh, uh, had the option to register for session number two. So hope you did it as such. Um, but if not, kind of keep checking out. I think the abstracts and all the information for the speakers are present on the website now. And I guess one last thing. So um, Kristen and Brenda don't have to thank themselves, but definitely appreciate all their input, all their time. It takes a lot of effort. Obviously, everybody knows to put these things together. Um, so they did a great job today. Thank you very much. And uh, just one last word. Uh, let's continue the discussion on Slack. And go ahead, Kristen, did you have one more thing? Nope, just saying bye. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, bye. ciao. Bye. <laughs>